on an incredible Tuesday, 7th day of June 2016, live in a multiple location station in more ways than I've got active brain cells. Welcome into Beyond Ringside's Back to Basics. Always in the mood to have a little fun on Tuesday nights. Live from Studio One, the Magic City Motor Mouth Fast Study Lane. Good to be joined by tag team partner Phil Stamper in just a little while. Kicking things off, by the way, first, before I go any further, thank you to everybody listening in to Beyond Ringside Sports Radio, whether it be through .com, whether it be ProWrestlingRadio.net, the Beyond Ringside Radio app for Amazon, Android, and BlackBerry, whether it be through Ustream or Ustream Mobile, and TuneIn in their mobile app. So many different ways to catch us, and there's more on the way, believe it or not. Honestly, there is. Like to welcome in adversarial good friend. In more ways than I've got active brain cells. Twice in one minute, I use that line. Not to mention, great colleague and probably one of the smoothest professionals you will ever run across. He is. He's, this man's got more hashtags in his gimmick name than I've got than I've got ways to think about it. Including, let's see, hashtag Supreme Fachi. I'm going to let him do that in just a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, he is known as the king of the southeast. Francisco Chiazzo. Francisco, how you doing tonight? Doing really, really well, man. I thought you were going to use the active brain cell line for a third time. Nope. I was going to say you went to the well one too many times, my friend. You would have got stopped by the boot and hit with the K5 within seconds of using that line for the third time. <laughs> How's everybody doing on this terrific Tuesday? Hashtag Tracy Smothers. He uses that line. I love good old Tracy Smothers, man. It's a battle. It's a war. Everybody dies. How's everybody doing tonight? It's been crazy. I've loved it. It's just one of these Tuesdays. It feels like an extension of Monday where you almost feel like it should be Friday. You're absolutely right. And my dachshund, my 40 pound dachshund Zelda is looking at me like I have 10 heads right now as I'm talking to you on this terrific Tuesday. <laughs> you are the Hydra. Hail Hydra. Now, <laughs> I've got to lay this one out there. Of course, uh, regular listeners know the last time you came on, you were, we were going back and forth about the situation which took place in Global, which, of course, you will be rejoining uh, Global Championship Wrestling. I do believe the return date um, is going to be Saturday, July the 30th, Pell City, Alabama. But, my God. And I know, see, I've actually had a conversation with Clyde Braddock also, and I don't know what's going to happen on Ju uh, July 30th, but I know, folks, if you think the 4th or the only time, will be the only time you see fireworks during the month of July, try again, because... Mr. Kiat, so when you and Clyde Braddock see eye to eye, it's only because you're about to slug each other in the face, right? Oh, absolutely, man. There's no two guys that like to punch each other in the face more than the grand design Clyde Braddock and the king of the southeast, Francisco Kiatso. You see, I, I've, I've actually liked Clyde Braddock. You know, I don't dislike him. Um, I don't hate him. Uh, this, isn't a, this isn't a matter of dislike. Uh, this is a matter of a guy that got too big for his britches, and I had to take him down a few pegs. You know, he's one of those guys that, that got a little steam behind him and uh, got a little too much steam, if you know what I mean. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, he, he, really didn't, uh, he really didn't understand the ramifications of, of, of going head-to-head -head with somebody like me. You see, I was uh, – he used to carry my groceries, my mother's groceries home from the bakery when I was a little kid. And, uh, and you know, the answer to that question would be why. It was out of respect. Uh, see, I come from a – I come from a place and a time and a family that everything was about respect. And right. A guy like Grand Design Clyde Braddock, he's nothing but a simpleton, a redneck. Uh, you know, he, he's the guy that mows lawns for people like me. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. Everyone's got to have their spot. Everyone's got to have their niche. Uh, his niche is underneath boots of guys like me. Got, you know, it, it's, it's, I, I, I heard some things he said about me over the last few months. I've heard some things he said about me even over the last few days. It's very disrespectful, and if I was him, I would mind my manners. Because when I see him on July 30th, I'm sure that Global Championship Wrestling, if they're smart and if they know what's good for them, and if they want to make some money, they'll put us head-to-head. -head. If they choose not to, I might just wait for him in the parking lot and stick a stickball bat right up his little fat ass. You see, Clyde Braddock was a guy that I used to, I guess, I guess for lack of a better term, you could say maybe take under my wing, so to speak. Um, you know, he's a collegiate wrestler, tough guy, strong guy, strong as an ox, but he's dumb. He's not very bright. So, you know, you get a guy like me who's, uh, who's equally as strong, um, equally as skilled, but the difference between Clyde Braddock and I is I'm smart and he's not. Okay. 
Now, do me a favor. Let me go ahead and ask this one because I've had the privilege of working with you down in the Gulf Coast um, and down in Florida as well as up here in Alabama. And I just really have to ask, you know, we have a lot of people have that nice little thing about getting outside your bubble, getting outside your safe zone. This is something that I don't think you've had a problem with for a long time. Even before we officially met, I knew that you were making road trips all over the place. And you've kind of told, you've hinted to it in previous days. But by the same token, when somebody is a little bit skittish about going outside their comfort zone, geographically speaking, what is the first thing you tell them? Uh, the first thing I tell them is you're never going to be successful in this business unless you go outside of your comfort zone. Unless you go outside of your geographical uh, five, ten miles outside your home. You see, I get a kick out of the weekend warriors. I get a kick out of the guys that, that uh, call themselves pros and call them, I'm a professional wrestler and I'm this and I'm that and so on and so forth. And you're going to catch me at, at GFWA or ABCDEFG promotion in, in you know, Bum Freak, Georgia, you know, uh, in a parking lot of an RV dealership. And you're not a professional wrestler. You're a weekend warrior. You know, and there's plenty of them out there. And you know what? I call it the Wednesday night softball league guys. And there's nothing wrong with being a Wednesday night softball league guy. If you understand your spot and you understand your place, you understand that you're going to get together on a Saturday night and uh, with your softball wrestling buddies, and you're going to have your little wrestling match in your RV park, and you're going to do it in front of your mom and your dad, granddad and your grandma and your auntie and your 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 uncle Bop Bop and your and, and your cousin Juju Bees and, and 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 you're gonna have your you're gonna have your your replica big gold WCW championship belt and and you're gonna call yourself a professional wrestler for a few hours and that's fine, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You just have to understand your spot. You have to understand that what you're doing isn't what I do. Okay, just like a gentleman who plays softball could never in a million years compare himself to someone who's let's say on the New York Yankees. Okay, that's in a World Series. Hell, they couldn't even compare themselves to a Triple A ball league, Single A ball league, Double A ball league. Okay, they're just simply beer drinking, fat gut Wednesday night softball league wrestlers. What I do is I'm a road warrior. I'm a journeyman. I enjoy being on the road. I enjoy going town to town, city to city, and border to border, entertaining fans all up and down the East Coast. Midwest, all over the entire world. See, I've been to England, China, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. You name it, I've been there. And I'm just getting started. See, a lot of people think I'm done. A lot of people think, well, geez, man, you've been wrestling for, you know, 16 plus years. You know, aren't you done yet? And I'm just getting started. I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm having more fun than I've ever had in my entire life. And I'm working for two of the best wrestling companies in the entire country right now. Arcadian Wrestling Association, World Wrestling Network, not to mention Global Championship Wrestling, Southern Fly Championship Wrestling, United States Wrestling Alliance in Jacksonville, Florida. You know, I'm all over the place. Soon I'll be coming to Steve Carino's promotion in North Carolina. You know, I got guys like Q-Ball Carmichael calling me. I got, you know, j just you name it. You know, I'm excited. I'm having fun. Stormy Lee's having fun. Uh, we're getting ready to move to Nashville, Tennessee. I'm probably jumping ahead of myself. I'm sure you have a bunch of notes on things you wanted to talk to me about, so I'm probably blowing your spots. <laughs> but I'm having a blast doing what I'm doing. But there's a huge difference, just to take it back around, there's a huge difference between what a lot of those guys do and what I do. Now, I'm going to shift for a second because I saw, I with all of the comments that I've seen posted, I'm going to take us outside the bubble for a hot second. Um, I remember comments made by the recently departed Muhammad Ali, how he would um, pattern some of the stuff that he did after people like Gorgeous George. And, of course, this man was no stranger to people like Freddie Blassie and, of course, Andre and Gorilla Monsoon and so many of us inside or so many people back in that day of pro wrestling before it was ever sports entertainment. Now, when you hear once when you hear somebody like Ali bring up a true icon in pro wrestling like Gorgeous George as one of his role models for <clears throat> cutting the promo. What goes through your head when you hear that somebody who was that out there, that at the top of their game, and I'm trying to find the right words, but when it comes to Ali, just legendary just doesn't cut it. Iconic is still an understatement. But when you hear Ali make a reference to Gorgeous George as one of his patterns and one of his role models for on the microphone, 
What what goes through your head? You know, I, I've actually known a lot about uh, you know legendary Muhammad Ali, and I've, I've I've watched him for years, and you know studied everything from his promo skills to his the 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 one liners and, and so on and so forth. And I never knew that about gorgeous George. Like I never knew that he, he, he had referenced, you know, professional wrestlers, but I, I, now that you say that I can see that and I, I can see how, I mean, that's, that's pretty damn cool. I mean, for lack of a better term, I mean, you've got a guy who's arguably uh, the greatest of all time, you know, professional boxer and, and for him to reference, you know, professional wrestlers and to take things from them and make it his own. I mean, that's cool as hell to me because I, you know, it, it, it's people would say what they want about professional wrestling. Oh, it's a, it, it's this, it's fake, and it's 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 a show and it's a farce and and so on and so forth. Man, whether I watch football, whether I watch UFC, whether I watch boxing, whether I watch baseball, hockey, basketball, you name it. At some point, you're going to see a reference made to professional wrestling. Basketball, NWA basketball players get entrances with music and pyro and smoke and lights. Who was the first to do that? Us. Professional wrestling. Okay? Boxers, all these guys never came to the ring with music. Who's the first to do it? Professional wrestling. Oh. The fabulous Freebirds, no less, were the first ones to come to the ring with music. In, the, in, in practical so, application, yeah. Yeah, right. Correct. So, you know, it, I'm not saying... I'm not naive to say here, oh, well, every sport takes something away from professional wrestling. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that whatsoever. But for somebody like Muhammad Ali, again, who's arguably the greatest of all time, to, to, to reference somebody like Gorgeous George, who was very similar to Ali in, in his form, okay? So you figure when Ali came around, there were some purists that weren't really happy with Ali, didn't like his big mouth, didn't like his, his, his boisterous ways, and he was full of himself and so on very much like Gorgeous George. So you got a guy like Gorgeous George when he came about, and I'm sure the George Hockenschmitz, you know, and the guys from that era weren't really happy with Gorgeous George because they weren't happy with his big mouth. They weren't happy with his boisterous ways, so on and so forth. So I could see where Muhammad Ali would take some of what Gorgeous George did and make it his own. It makes sense to me. You know, and this is something that I've often j- I've joked about over the last few years because as somebody who has been watching mixed martial arts as well as especially the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship, I joke about the fact, and which actually is quite serious, the fact that if you notice a lot of the guys who get that big push in UFC are the ones who know how to dusty a card, i.e. talk fans into the seats. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I mean, Conor McGregor is the, is, is the is first person that comes to mind. I'm a huge, huge McGregor fan. I don't care that he lost a fight. Every fighter loses at some point. I don't care how good you are. Ali lost plenty of times. Okay, so you know, Mike Tyson lost. I mean, I don't care how great you are. You're going to get hit one night, and you're going to get knocked out. Or in this case, you're going to get choked out. Or you're going to get kicked to sleep. It's going to happen. I don't care how great you are. Everybody who's great falls. So it doesn't make you not great, for lack of a better term, because you fall or because you get knocked out. What makes you great is that you're able to come back and be great again. That's what makes you great. That's what turns you into an icon. You know, but guys, but to take it back around because I'll go off on a tangent. Um, Conor McGregor was that guy. He was the guy that could talk people into the seats. You know, and, and the kicker was he was able to produce when he did it. Because, you know, it kind of sucks when you're able to talk people into the seats and then you get your ish kicked in, first fight, and no one ever sees you again. That sucks, you know. Um, you know, that's that, that's like CNC Music Factory. They had one hit and they were gone. Yeah. Four, actually. But, yeah, one actually stayed near the top of the charts the longest time. <laughs> that's that's the, old, the only song that I remember, and I'm trying to think of the damn name of it, was... Uh, I can I can see the video in my head, but I can't think of what the damn name was. But uh, <laughs> but it was what it, the, the one that I remember was the one that I'm talking about. That Everybody was like their hit that stayed there forever. Now. And when you hear when you hear it, you go, God, that's CNC Music Factory. Yeah, um, it's yeah. the one that always starts out with "Everybody Dance Now." Dance, yes, that one. Dance, yes, dance, that dance. one. That that every 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 uh, high school football basketball. Yeah such and such team plays before their game or half the cheerleading routines you've ever seen or half the correct. Yes. 
No, because remember CNC Music Factory also had the song "Things That Make You Go Hmm." Yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty good too. That was pretty good too. And then, of course, Freedom Williams decided to go out on his own. Had one hit, and that was it. So you forget I'm the DJ. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was a bad. Yeah, I, I forget you're a DJ sometimes. That was a pretty bad idea for him to do that. Yeah, I know. It's like, and that's the funny part about it. And this is something that really comes into the world of pro wrestling because I'm tying this in in a different way because you've had some good tag team partners. You've had some great tag team partners. You've had great success as part of a tag team, whether it be the COD, whether it be the Slambinos, excuse me, Slambinos. Um, just make sure I pronounce it right because I don't want to hear about it later. Uh, but from there, you've also had tremendous success in singles. And it's normally a case where you have one, we've seen it, and everybody runs the joke about who's the Genetti after the Rockers, if you remember that. Not everybody can be the Rock and Roll Express, where both ascend to that height. But by the same token, you've had great success in singles as well as tag teams. Now, what do you attribute overall your success and the chemistry that you've had in tag team uh, wrestling? Adaptability. Uh, adapt, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead and cut no, you off. Um, You're good. That was very rude of me, so I apologize. But Dude, it was, you're fine. Um, adaptability, honestly, Eddie. I mean, you know, at, at the end of the day, you've got to be able to adapt. Whether it's And that's a life lesson. You've got to be able to adapt to your surroundings. Um, I think, and in fact, I just talked to Ron Neamey, hardcore giant Ron Neamey, uh, who uh, used to run Florida and IPW back in the day in NWA Florida. And uh, there was, I always say if there was no Ron Neamey, there would have been no Francisco Chiazzo. Um he gave me my first real, real shot at the business. But um, I remember I was kind of toiling around at IPW. I didn't know what the hell, or NWA Florida. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Uh, they didn't know what to do with me. In comes Marcus Dillon, um, who's, you know, has become a very successful actor. Actually, he was in, uh, he was in that movie, the, uh, the Late Shift, which right. got all kinds of awards on Netflix. Uh, he was the cop uh, that was in that, uh, one of the cops uh, that had a, a pretty major role in that movie. Um, and he was just recently in a, in a, uh, God, a, a commercial that went kind of went viral and so on and so forth. But anyway, uh, his real name is Matt Doman. Uh, so you should look him up on Facebook. He's an incredible actor. Uh, but we went by, uh, Marcus Dillon and we were called the double deuce. And there was many, 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 many different forms of double deuce before me and Marcus Dillon. But the most successful form of double deuce was, was him and I, um, so Ron didn't know what to do with him either. He was a big jacked up 300 pound, you know, behemoth. So he just put us together one night. Ah, I'll put you guys together as a team and see what you guys can do. And we took off. And I think that attribute that had a lot to do with the fact that I was able to adapt. You know, you know, Marcus was pretty green. He was only about maybe two or three years in the business. Uh, at the time, I was about seven or eight uh, in the business, that, or maybe seven, maybe a little bit less. I can't quite remember. But um, I think what it really comes down to is just being able to adapt. And you have to kind of take the cards that you're dealt and, and, and turn them into a full house. You know, what's that old adage, turning chicken dish into chicken, into chicken salad? Right. You know, um, you know, they say you can't do that. Um, I don't know. I beg to differ. You know, um, I'm not really sure I'd want to eat chicken dish, but <laughs> follow my point here. But um, you, you, you're not always dealt the top hand. You know, you're not always dealt the top top of the card guy. You're not always – I never I never saw myself as the uh, – and, and – I might shoot myself in the foot here with saying this, but, you know, I never saw myself as the John Cena. I never saw myself as the Rock. I never saw myself as, as, as the guy or the top guy. But I'm, I'm, I will tell you this much. I'm the mechanic. I'm the guy you can put in the ring with anybody. I'm the guy that you can put on any card in any city, anywhere in the world, and get the best crowd reaction of the night. And that goes for spot monkeys. That goes for old school guys. That goes for collegiate wrestling guys. That goes for you name it to put it in the ring. No one's going to get a better crowd reaction than me. And somebody who's going to listen to this goes, wow, he's full of himself. You know, and you know what? They're probably true. I am full of myself. But I can back it up because there's not a crowd that I've wrestled in front of. There's not a town that I've rolled into. There's not a country or a continent that I've wrestled on that I didn't get an amazing crowd reaction. And what that comes from is being able to identify with the crowd and adapt to your surroundings. You have to know your audience. You know, when I'm, when I'm teaching and when I'm coaching guys and girls, I try to explain to them, when you walk into Outback and you want to have a steak and you sit down for dinner and there's fish on the table, you didn't want fish, you wanted steak. Now imagine walking out 
and having the mindset that you're going to tell that crowd what they're going to eat. They tell you to go screw yourself. I want steak. You're going to have fish. <laughs> That's what's wrong with a lot of guys nowadays is they can't adapt to their surroundings. You don't walk into a small town in bum screw Alabama and hit nine backflips. Number one, they're not going to get it. You're going to give them way too much, and they're not going to be able to digest it. Now, you might go to New York, or you might go to Philadelphia, or you might go to even Chicago. And that might work. You might be able to hit nine backflips and get, that was amazing, please come back, and so on and so forth. So you have to know your audience. You have to know your surroundings. You have to be able to adapt to every town, to every opponent, to every partner, regardless of where you're at. Over the last few weeks, and I'm not going to pick on one match in particular. I'm not going to pick on one promotion in particular. I'm not going to pick on one geographic region or even continent. Hint, hint. There's been a firestorm of opinion on every side of this topic about you make the reference to the flips and talk about spot monkeys. And that just gave me the perfect door. Are the generations in pro wrestling too hard on each other are people who've been in it five and 10 years harder on those that have been are more critical of those that have been in it for 15, 20 and vice versa that you've been able to see personally. Um, yeah, I think, I think some of it is with, 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 with good merit. Um, look at it this way. Okay. They're, they're typically, there's a basic way to fix a car. Okay. If you're – now, cars don't have carburetors anymore. Let me back up. Cars don't have carburetors anymore, correct? Right. The new cars, Most right? cars don't. I'm not a car guy, but I do know that much. They don't have carburetors. I, I can't remember the year that they stopped having carburetors, but they – you cannot get a car anymore with a carburetor. They just don't exist, okay? So if you have a mechanic that was a mechanic for the last 20 years, let's just say, he was around when those carburetors were around. Right. Am I not correct? Right. Correct. Go. So, so – um, as a mechanic, you have to evolve and you have to be able to adapt. Again, we're going to go back to that word. Yep. You have to be able to adapt as time goes on or you're going to get swallowed up and left behind. Okay. Now, the basic premise of a car does not change. The basic inner workings of a car does not change for the most part. Now, of course, you've got your exceptions with your Priuses and your little faggy from the cars and you know, and all that garbage. You have your electric cars and all that. And I'm sure someone's get mad that I said faggy. I don't care. So, um, but, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, the basic premise of fixing a car is the same. Like the, the, the shell, the, it, all cars are pretty much the same. Okay. So nine times out of 10, if you can, if you can work on cars, you can just about work on any car. Now you might have to look in a book and, and figure out how to fix the new Mazda 6 you know, because something might not be in the same place or whatever the case may be, but you have to evolve. Now, I know this is very long-winded, and people are probably sitting here going, what the hell is he talking about? Why is he talking about fixing cars? The point I'm trying to make is you have to evolve, okay? I started wrestling uh, in 19 Mind Your Business, <laughs> and I, there, was, there was very few guys that were doing a lot of the things that – and uh, uh, I'll go ahead and bring up their names because I'm sure either you were going to bring it up or somebody was going to bring it up. The, the match that went viral with Ricochet and uh, Osprey, I think it was. Well, um, that's, that's Osprey, one of I them, think. but I wasn't going to bring up the names, but go ahead. Yeah, and, and I think that that match went viral. And, and, and I don't know Osprey, but I've met Ricochet on several occasions. I've been on several cards with, with Ricochet. And um, I watched the match. And while it's not my style, um, and it's not my per se cup of tea, um, I can't fish on it by no stretch. Those guys are incredible at what they do. They are incredible at that style. They are, are phenomenal athletes. And anybody who would out and out sh on that match has no business in the business. They're incredible. When you've got professionals like Chris Jericho and, and so on and so forth putting that match over, and not the match itself, but the guys, the right. talent that they both have is unparalleled, and it's unbelievable. Now, is it my style and is it my cup of tea? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, there's also a lot of music that isn't my cup of tea either. It doesn't make it, that doesn't make that musician a bad musician because I don't care for their music. 
That just means I'm just not a fan of their music. I'm not a fan of their style. They're, they might not be a fan of mine, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that my style's wrong. It's just a different style. There's different styles of fighting. There's different styles of playing, uh, throwing a football. Um, but at the end of the day, our job is to go out there and elicit a response from the crowd. Okay? If we're doing that, then you're doing your job. There's no, there's no exact way to do what we do. There's a basic premise. There's a basic premise, and the second you go outside of that basic premise, that's when you run into problems. Osprey and Ricochet did not go outside that basic premise. Now, I could probably look at that match and tear it apart and say they did this, they did that, just as they, they could probably look at my matches and do the same exact thing. That's what we do as professionals. That's what we do as, as athletes. That's what we do as competitors. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I think that – and, and – when I look at some comments that I read on Facebook and Twitter and, and, and even on Instagram and so on, where I, I guess to answer, your, to answer your point, to answer your question, I do think in a way that, that, that people are way too hard on each other when it comes to these kind of things. You just have to open your mind a little bit and kind of think outside the box and look to the crowd. If they're having a good time, they're the ones that are paying their 10 their 15 or 20 30 40 $100 to see these guys do what they do. And I think at the end of the day, that's what matters. Would I have a whole card full of that? No, absolutely not. Would I place that match right before my main event? No, absolutely not. Unless that match was the main event. So that's my own personal opinion. So, um, you know, I, I travel a lot and I see a lot of different professionals. I see a lot of different shows and events and, and so on and so forth. Um, I could tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, that if you are not prepared to evolve in this business, you will get swallowed up, you will be miserable and bitter, just like any other business. As a musician, as, as a DJ, mm-hmm. okay, you have to evolve. Always. It doesn't, you, cannot, you can no longer go up there with just a microphone, uh, a, a friggin' tape player, and some speakers mm-hmm. and get away with it. Right. It doesn't work. It's not going to work. You know, professional wrestling is the same way. You have to evolve. No matter what business you're in, you have got to evolve with the times. You are listening to Be on Ringside Back to Basics on this seventh day of June, 2016. The Magic City Motor Mouth Fast Study Lane being joined on the Tuesday conversation by the King of the Southeast, Francisco Chiazzo. What is greater, the number of milestone lessons that you actually learn in pro wrestling or the number of milestone lessons we learn about ourselves in pro wrestling? Ooh. I'm going to go with what I learned about myself. Before you can understand anything else, and I'm not a psychologist, but before you can understand anything else in this world, doesn't make a difference what the business is, whether it's banking, wrestling, football, radio, you name it. You first have got to understand what makes yourself tick. You have to understand what's important to you, and you have to understand and find yourself. Then, and only then, will you, have, will you be able to appreciate the things around you and the people around you and, and what you can offer. How, how can I offer something to someone, a wrestling company, a promoter, another wrestler, a peer, a friend, if I don't first understand what makes myself tick? Does that make sense? Yes. You go to the bonus round. <laughs> now, I, now I ask the fun one. We all have heard the term wrestling royalty. And folks, before I delve any further into the statement that, and the question that I'm about to ask Francisco, I lay this on the line because I have not personally been to this event which they've had a couple and they've got more on the way. Hint, hint. But from there, I've also worked with both who have that crown, so to speak. How does the king of the Southeast respond when another king infringes upon the path? And I'm referring, once again, I don't know which locker room is which in this particular venue. I know you. I know Shane Williams. I've worked with both of you. I've worked with you more than I've worked with Shane Williams, who actually I've been work. I'm actually about to try to get back on beyond ringside. But 
when you have another king in your path? What is the first response? And then what is the gut response? My first response is we're about to go to war. Um, I don't care who you are. Uh, there can't be two lions in a pack. You know, there, there's one. You know, lions, you know, that, that's where the term alpha male comes from. There, there's, there's, there's one. There's one lion in the pack. You can't have two. So uh, when I came to Arcadian uh, Wrestling Association, and realized and saw the saw the talent listing and and you know King Shane has been someone I've actually followed and been a fan of for many years, uh, as well as Queen Taylor. Um, we've kind of run parallel in, di- in different markets. Uh, mine, of course, being the Southeast. His, of course, being the Mid Atlantic, um, Mid Atlantic area, uh, and and Mid South, Tennessee and and and, and Arkansas, and Mississippi area. Um, but, you know, he, he's, he's somebody I, I was a very big fan of. Uh, I was a big fan of his work um, until uh, we both signed on with Arcadian Wrestling. And I remember talking to Stormy, and I was like, yes, yeah, this, this ain't going to work. You know, um, I remember we were driving to the first tour that we ended up getting snowed in at. And I looked at her, and I said, you know, we're, we're probably going to end up going head-to-head with these two. And, you know, she was like, ah, oh, well, you know, let's see how it goes and, and so on. But I knew. I knew it would happen eventually, and it didn't happen the first tour. It didn't happen the second tour, and then of course I got, I got the, uh, I got the match listing. Sure enough, first match on the first night of the tour, King of the Southeast, Francisco Chiazzo, with the Queen of the Southeast, Stormy Lee versus King Shane Williams, with Queen Taylor. And I remember I looked at Stormy and I showed her my phone and I said, "I told you, it took three or four months, but I told you, and I knew it was going to happen." But I knew going into this, well, there was only going to be room for one king in Arcadian Wrestle, and that's going to be us. And I'm sure he felt the same way about himself and Queen Taylor. Um, you've got two alpha males uh, who you know, I can't say we don't like dislike each other. We don't know each other. We've only met each other on, on a couple of different occasions. I think for the first time I met him was at WrestleCade in North Carolina, uh, maybe about six, seven months ago. Um, he knew who I was. I knew who he was. But, again, we ran in different markets, so we never, never would – would run into each other until now. Now, there has been a very intriguing game, so to speak. From the outside looking in, I can call it an an intriguing game. From the inside looking out in this particular perspective, you can say, yeah, this game hurt. (laughs) It it actually left you with a uh, minor concussion. But it also left Shane Williams with (laughs) one. Yeah, yeah, trust me. It wasn't, uh, I wasn't the only one that had my noggin rocked uh, this last tour. You know, we were in, if I'm not mistaken, it was Ashland City, Tennessee, in the Ashland City Armory. Uh, packed crowd, and it was hot as hell. Oh, man, it was miserably hot. And I was already pissed off because I had freaking 1,000 degrees, and, and, and I don't know if the AC broke or what the hell was going on, but, man, I'm freaking, I was hot. You know, Stormy was hot. I was, I went and sat in my car and it was, AC was blowing on me and I was dying. I was miserable and I couldn't get enough water in me. So I was already pissed off going into, you know, into the match. And, uh, you know, when he and I locked horns, you know, the crowd went nuts, you know, cause it's a match that they've been, they've been waiting for, for years, you know, probably good, maybe even four or five years ever since I became King of Florida, you know, they've, they've, I would always, every, I always get messages from fans and so on and so forth. What if, and what if, and what if, well, the what if finally was over. Cause there we are locking horns in Ashton city, Tennessee for Arcadian wrestling. And much to his chagrin, I knocked his ass out and sent him to the hospital in Ashland city, Tennessee. And poor little queen Taylor was laying over her, her, her husband and begging me not to finish him. I should have finished her. I should have finished both of them. But Stormy leaves the one with the heart. There's a picture floating around on Facebook with her hand on my chest and me, le- and me leaning back with the brass knuckles. I should have finished her. You know, the kingdom, it would have been mine. Arcadia Russell would have just been mine, plain and simple. But I didn't. I listened to my girl, and, I, of course, I didn't finish him. Next time, I'm not going to listen to her, and I'm going to finish him. Because on the next night in Murfreesboro, you faced off against Tattoo, and I believe from that vantage point, 
on, let's see, you faced off against Tattoo on both the 26th and 27th, Murfreesboro and Springfield, and then it came down to May 28th in Gallatin, where it was Shane Williams and Francisco Chiazzo one more time. And I believe oh, this, go ahead. Let's not, for, let's not forget, I'm going to cut you off for a second. Go let's ahead. not forget that King Shane, unlike me, I came at him face to face. I was in the middle of a match with Tattoo, second night, he got his rematch, so I kicked his ass the first night, so he came back for a rematch, hopefully going to the pay window, because the kid's got to eat, and right before I was about to hit the K5, here comes King Shane, interjecting himself, see, he spent the night in the hospital after Ashland City, Tennessee, so he didn't make the Thursday night show, Right. he was there Friday, and he jumped me from behind, caused a disqualification, so not only did he cost the match, you know, the match to get thrown out, he caused Tattoo not to go to the pay window. I'm sure the kid didn't eat again. And by the looks of him, he needs to eat. <laughs> Gave me a nice little shiner under my left eye. And being the professional that I am, I wasn't paid to fight that. And I wasn't paid to fight King Shane Williams. So I rolled out and took the high road, the professional that I am. And King Shane ended up pile driving one of the security guys, for Christ's sake. This guy's out of control. That's going to cost you know, him some money, I'm, I'm sure. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I'm, posi- I'm positioning myself to lobby against the pile driver. I want the damn thing illegal. So I'm walking back from the locker room, and there's Leah Hulan, the owner of Arcadian Wrestling, shaking her wares and telling me that she can puff her chest out like I can. And she's going to sign a brass knuckles on a pole match. Now, I don't know about you, but brass knuckles on a pole match is quite possibly one of the most dangerous matches in professional wrestling. I don't like heights. I don't want to climb up a 20-foot pole to get something that I can just hand to Stormy to have her hand me. Not that I've ever done that, mind you. <clears throat> you can clear your throat all you want. I can do that, too. <clears throat> <laughs> but she signed this, this match. My name, my name didn't even end up on the contract. I guess somewhere in my Arcadian wrestling contract, there's a there's some clause in there that says she can do whatever she wants because she's the boss. Because I showed up the next night, and I already had some 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 preconceived notion that this match wasn't going to happen. Then all of a sudden, no, it's happening. I walk out to the arena, and there's a 20 foot pole attached to the Arcadian wrestling <laughs> wrestling ring with brass knuckles hanging from it. 20 feet, Eddie Lane. Mr. Chiazzo, I have to do this, and I hate to cross the streams. I normally do not do this, but um, the reason why I so gingerly cleared my throat is, you forget, not only at one point in time was I the commissioner for Global Championship Wrestling, but I'm also one of the ones who does commentary as well as ring announcing. There's very few things I don't see. Should I leave that there? (laughs) You know what? I've seen you with glasses on. You don't have 20-20 vision. Whatever you've seen, you probably haven't seen. It was probably, Stormy probably had a watch on that looked like a pair of brass knuckles. Never in a million years would I use brass knuckles. They're illegal. I got one as a belt buckle, but brass knuckles are illegal, and I'm an upstanding citizen. I'm a professional. I would never use something like that. And you unlike, also- unlike King Shane Williams, who in Gallatin, Tennessee, managed to get those brass knuckles from the 20-foot high pole and hit me right under my right eye, causing me to get a level 7 concussion. I didn't even know concussions went that high. A level 7 concussion, which caused me not only to not go to the pay window, Stormy Lee didn't eat that night. I ate. She didn't eat. So come this June tour... Arcadian Wrestling presents Untouchables, brought to you by Grumpy's Bail Bonds. I can guarantee you that when I get my hands on King Shane Williams and Queen Taylor, there is going to be a different outcome. See, I don't care about Leah Hulan or the AWA office. I don't care about the rules anymore because obviously the rules don't matter. You know, what's next? A pistol on a pole match? Are we just going to go shooting people now? Is that that what's next? I don't think we'll go that far. I mean... 
well, hey, I don't know. Brass knuckles are illegal, too. You know, there's no open carry laws in Tennessee. What are we going to do? We have a samurai sword on a pole match. We're going to cut my arm off. You know, I'm a professional athlete. I'm paid to wrestle. I'm not paid to climb a 20-foot pole like an orangutan and pull down a pair of brass knuckles. You know, Lord knows what happens to the, the orangutans and the monkeys now when there's, you know, they get shot in zoos. So who knows? We're going to shoot a wrestler at a wrestling show. I mean, what, what the hell is going on now? Only if it's a super soaker or possibly a dollar bill gun that you used at the nudie bar, but I haven't seen one of those at a wrestling show yet. I don't go to nudie bars. Neither do I. Never been to one one day in my life. <clears throat> Two days maybe, but not one day. <laughs> However, <laughs> oh, maybe one or two. <laughs> Just kidding, kids. No, I'm not. From that vantage point, I know that you've got Thursday, June 16th in McMinnville, Tennessee, Friday, June 17th in Springville, Tennessee, both with Arcadian Wrestling. Now, have you found out if you and Shane Williams are going to cross paths again, or is this still to, uh, to be, de- I almost said to be determined. Ha! Well, we use that one anyway. What up, Wick? No, I haven't found out. They haven't let me know anything. Um, I'm coming off several, and, and the funny thing is that I'm coming off, I've got, I've got so many irons in the fire. I'm coming off different suspensions, different promotions. I'm coming off from suspensions from Global Championship Wrestling. I'm coming off a suspension from World Wrestling Network uh, in, in the Tampa, Newport, Richie, Florida area. Um, I mean, hell, I might even be getting suspended from Southern Fried Championship Wrestling for, you know, uh, I don't know, Jagged Edge was just hanging around this last weekend, so it caused a little bit of a, a ruckus and a riot in Monroe, Georgia. So people have been calling me a loose cannon. You know, uh, you know, as of late, I, I'm not really sure why they would call me that. Um, I'm just doing what needs to be done by any means necessary um, to uh, to get the job done. You know, um, not really sure how that noose got around Jagged Edge's neck, but it ended up getting around his neck. I'm not really sure how he ended up hanging over the top rope, but he did. So, you know, there, there's there, there's several things that I guess I've done over the last few months to warrant suspensions and and so on and so forth. And um I'm going to continue to do it. I'm going to continue to do what I want when I want. And uh, um, if, if that means I get suspended and then come back and then beat somebody, at, beat somebody up again and get suspended and come back, and that's fine. Uh, but to answer your question, I'm not really sure what I'm doing yet. I'm not really sure if our paths are going to cross. Um, I'm certain they will one way or the other, whether it's in the parking lot, whether it's in a locker room. Um, I'm going to get my hands on King Shane Williams. Uh, whether it's in a ring or not is beyond my control. I mean – Hell, Leah, Leah Hulan, the owner of AWA, might just sign a contract to push me out of an airplane, I guess. I don't know. You know, she suspended Derek King. He's still under suspension. You know, uh, I guess I guess Chase Stevens is like the, the, the only one who could do no wrong in her eyes. You know, and Chris Thorne and, you know, Gangrel, you know, they're all they're all her favorites. You know, screw everybody else. I would be more than interested in actually speaking to Miss Hulan just to find out exactly where her head is at going into the upcoming show and coming out of the May tour. Well, just put a little microphone on her uh, on her lapel. Uh, on her lapel, you could talk into her boobs. Really? There's... I'm just saying. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> How tall? Okay, okay. I can get in serious trouble right now, so I'm going to divert. Nine minutes before the top of the hour on the live side, folks. Once again, Fast Study Lane alongside of Francisco Chiazzo, the king of the Southeast, on this episode of Black, uh, Back to Basics. You see, you got me screwing it up. Thanks, Frankie. <laughs> oh, you won for that one. <laughs> Next time we go for wings, you are not getting the non fat ones, okay? You're going to get, get all the breading. Now, before we before I before I let you run in it, because we're about to hit that shameless portion of the show, hint, hint. But there is one other thing that I want to bring up. You have had probably, to my knowledge, one of the most sustained rivalries, whether it's in Georgia, whether it's around the southeast mid-Atlantic area, all the way down to the Sunshine State, with a gentleman who... And actually, now it appears to be going deeper. It's a family thing where you, the king of the Southeast, and wrestling's best kept secret, Micah Taylor, just seem to keep butting heads in different places. How deep does the rivalry really run? Oh, man, this dates back to WWE's developmental territory in Deep South. I mean, he used to... uh 
it was no it was no secret I was the green boy that came in there and 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 you know I wasn't on the paper quote unquote so um I was an unsigned talent working for Deep South and uh you know everyone used to rib and joke around and so on and so forth and you know it was dates back and it, and you know I look back on it now and I, and I can kind of giggle at it now but you know there there was this one night where I was about to hit the ring and I was doing a uh, I, I would throw back Frankie Coverdale, you know, had brand new gear on and, and a satin jacket and I was ready to rock and roll. And I heard my name called, turned around, you know, he shot me with a super soaker right between the legs and this big old wet patch on my crotch. Okay. And he thought it was funny and you're going to laugh. And I'm sure a lot of listeners are going to laugh too. And everyone thought it was funny. That was my first, my first opportunity to get on what you would consider, I guess, developmental WWE TV. I couldn't have been more embarrassed. You know, this was my livelihood. This is something I waited for my whole life. Micah Taylor thought it was funny. So throughout my time, my tenure at Deep South, you know, I, I would mind my business, and I just wanted to get signed. I just wanted a job. But guys like Micah Taylor had their thumb right on top of my head, making sure that it was that glass ceiling. I only got so high. I only got so far. People would say, oh, would you blame Micah Taylor for you, you know, for you not getting signed? You know what? I do. I blame Micah Taylor. I blame Tracy Taylor. I blame the whole lot of them. All I wanted was an opportunity, and they took that from me. Micah Taylor can be called the best-kept secret. He's a Marine. He's decorated. He was a sharpshooter. He's a hero. Screw him. Screw him being a hero. And screw him being a Marine as far as I'm concerned. Because just because you're a Marine doesn't make you a hero. He's a piece of crap in my eyes. And yeah, we butt heads all over the Southeast. We butt heads in AWA. We're going to butt heads again June 18th. Right. When SWA comes to Crestview, along with the love of my life, the queen of the Southeast, Stormy Lee, is in a three-way dance with Wildcat sports star Katie Forbes and Micah's wife, Tracy Taylor. So don't think for one second that I'm not going to be around ringside when that match happens. Don't think for one second that I'm going to let Micah get away with what he's gotten away with for all these years. Because Micah Taylor is a coward. He was a coward in Global Championship Wrestling. He's a coward in AWA. He was a coward in Deep South. And he'll always be a coward. I have too much fun when you and I sit down to talk. Because the, I, I always know that, A, you're going to shoot straight. And you're going to shoot straight from the hip. But I'm also going to lay this one on the line. And we kind of paraphrased it a second ago when you kind of hinted and alluded to it. Saturday, June 18th, Crestview, Florida, the Crestview National Guard Armory on James... E. James, uh, excuse me, James Lee Boulevard. It is you and Micah Taylor. One on one. What can the fans in Crestview expect in that match between you and Mr. Taylor? Oh, they can expect a fight, no doubt. 100%. And it's for the AIWF America's Heavyweight title. A title that I've made. I made that title popular. You know, people always say, oh, well, the title makes the man. I made the title. I'm the most popular and the most decorated AIWF heavyweight champion, AIWF America's heavyweight champion. Excuse me, I almost called myself heavyweight champion. That's Damian Wayne Costell. He's the AIWF world heavyweight champion. But I'm the most decorated AIWF America's heavyweight champion that there ever was or ever will be. I'm showing up to Crestview with that title, and I'm leaving Crestview with that title. And I will assume that this weekend actually – because AIWF also has a double shot with Central All-Star Wrestling. Um, Friday, June 10th, also Callaway, Florida. Um, yeah, Callaway, Florida at the Callaway Rec Center. Um, you are slated to be on that show, and I'm actually taking this one out from under you because I know that you have these rapid fires set and ready to go. And on the 11th, you're going to be in Daleville, Alabama with Central All-Star, 454 Highway 84 East in Daleville at the Daleville Phillip VFW. So I imagine the, the America's title will probably be on the line both of those nights or one of those nights? Uh, yes, sir, they will. The IWF America's, uh, America's Championship will be on the line Friday night against the professional Justin Overstreet, uh, from what I've been told. 
Um, I think he's a number five or number six contender uh, for the America's title. In fact, he's a former AIWF uh, World Heavyweight Champion as right. well, two-time uh, AIWF World Heavyweight Champion, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, so depending on the outcome of Friday night, uh, that'll be determined who I defend my title uh, against on Saturday. So, uh, but uh, uh, definitely check out Central All Star Wrestling. Definitely check out Arcadian Wrestling. World Wrestling Network, ACW, uh, Shine, I mean, you name it. I work for some of the best companies in the entire country, Global Championship Wrestling, Southern Fried Championship Wrestling. Um, I mean, you name it. You know, we're city to city, border to border. I'm going to be for be up for PWF in uh, Steve Carino's uh, company in North Carolina at the end of August, uh, and back to Global Championship Wrestling. So we're, uh, we just received dates through the end of the year for World Wrestling Network as well as Arcadian. So we're we're very busy, very fortunate. Whether you boo us, whether you cheer us, as long as there's an ass every 18 inches, that's what matters to me and Stormy Lee. Uh, we're very fortunate to be able to do what we do at the level we're doing it at. We're very fortunate uh, for you know, re- regardless of what my personal feelings are, uh, we're we're very fortunate to work for the companies that we work for uh, and the people like Sal Hamoy. Uh, who runs World Wrestling Network, uh, Leo Hulan, uh, who runs uh, Arcadian, Dan Sawyer Global, uh, Charles Anschwitz at uh, at Southern Fried, um, you know, Paul Eubanks, Central All-Star. Um, you know, it's all the companies that are bringing us in uh, for the first time. Uh, I think we're going to be making our way to South Dakota, actually, uh, in the coming, I think in July, either July or August, I have to go back and look at my calendar. Uh, I've never been to South Dakota, so I'm looking forward to that. Myself and Eric Wayne and the Queen of the Southeast Storm of the Year are going to be heading to South Dakota. So we've got a lot of good things coming up. Um, it's radio shows like this that give me the avenue and the platform to run my mouth and, 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 and to inform everybody and to kind of shoot from the hip. So I, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I know we have a lot of fun and we, uh, we have a little bit of a love-hate relationship, but we have a mutual respect that goes both ways, and I'm very fortunate for that. And it does go both ways because I have a world of respect for what you've been able to accomplish in this industry. I have a world of respect for you being the real individual that you are, whether it be behind the scenes in, you know, what they call shoot life uh, and or whether it be in front of the cameras, all of the above when the red light comes on. And, you know, and it's a mutual admiration association of reality here because, you know, you I'm. Pulling back the curtain for a hot second, I made a road trip a while back when Vintage Wrestling Florida was having their big cage war games, and the hospitality that I was shown between you and one of your tag team partners, Simon Says, um, was immeasurable, appreciated beyond belief, and I still thank you to this day for everything that y'all did for putting up with me while I was down there. Um, (laughs) It was a lot of fun. I, and I wish that I could have made it back down because I was going to try to get down for the anniversary show. Um, but unfortunately, real life intervened. And once again, I planted my ass in Birmingham, taking care of personal business and family stuff. But, you know, um, but I'll lay it out there like that. You know, there are people in this industry and in the sport of professional wrestling that you can sit down, whether you're coming out of the same locker room or different locker rooms at the end of the night, and you can have that love-hate relationship because we, as we get time in this industry, we understand the industry a little bit better and the personalities they're in. And, you know, he said it perfectly, and I'm going to stop babbling now. Uh, do you want to run him rapid fire, or do you want to go and take him one more time for the next couple of weekends? No, I think you hit on all the weekends I'm going to be at and, and, and did a very good job of promoting everything. I just want to thank everybody for, you know, I know it sounds corny and sounds cheesy, but I want to thank every fan. Uh, that comes out, pays their hard-earned money to see what, see us do what we do. Not just me, but for everybody. Uh, everybody that laces up the boots on a continuous basis. Um, you know, seeing professionals like Chase Stevens and Damian Wayne Costell and, and, and you know, Dan Sawyer and, and, you know, as much as I hate his guts, A.J. Steele. And just, just there's so much good talent out there. Uh, the independent wrestling circuit right now is hottest, hotter, hotter than it's ever been. Um, guys are able to, to, if they work hard enough, they're able to make a living in this business outside of world wrestling entertainment outside of TNA. Um, you know, there's amazing companies that are coming up right now, like PCW in California. Uh, there's, you know, Lucha underground there's, there's, you know, ring of honor. There's Arcadian wrestling. There's, you know, there, there's so many amazing companies that are out there that are, that are high level independent wrestling companies that are giving guys and girls opportunities both in the ring and out. 
and it's places like Arcadian Wrestling and World Wrestling Network that are that are given the platforms and the opportunities to the guys and girls that want them and that are willing to work hard for them. Um, it, you know, the the work is out there, but you've got to put in the time and you've got to drive the miles and you've got to spend the time in the gym and 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 invest in yourself. And I think that's what it really comes down to. I took one method of rapid fire away from him, but I'm going to turn it back over to him for this one. How can everybody track you and the Queen of the Southeast down on social media? And I dare you, how many of the hashtags can you lay out there? <laughs> uh, you can reach us on Facebook, Francisco Chiazzo at Facebook.com, uh, Stormy Lee Sloan at Facebook.com. You can catch us both on Twitter, uh, Stormy Lee 327, uh, Francisco Chiazzo on Twitter, Francisco Chiazzo on Instagram. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, she's going to kick my ass. I think her Instagram is StormyLee327 at Instagram. Uh, you can also find me on Pinterest. I think I'm the only straight man on Pinterest. <laughs> hashtag Supreme Fachim. Hashtag Supreme Slambino. Hashtag Bonnie and Clyde of Professional Wrestling. Hashtag King of the Southeast. Hashtag Queen of the Southeast. Hashtag It's Me, It's Me. Hashtag It's Stormy Lee. Thank you for having me on tonight. We really appreciate it. We will see you guys down the road. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only, the King of the Southeast, Francisco Chiazzo, right here on the Tuesday Night Conversation on Back to Basics. Hang tight. Back to Basics rolls on right after this. This is Dale the Demon Torborg, and you're locked in to Beyond Ringside. When planning your next party or special event, insist on the best. Full Range Entertainment is a professional entertainment company providing a full range of services. From professional disc jockeys and MCs to catering and photography, when the details of your special day must be perfect, call us first. Wedding receptions, corporate parties, school functions, birthday celebrations, and more. We also have Birmingham's largest selection of karaoke tracks available. With over 40 years combined experience, Full Range Entertainment can provide you with the talent and professionalism you need and deserve to make your next event one you'll never forget for more information on the full range of services we offer call 533 hits that's 533 h-i-t-s or check us out on our website at fullrangeentertainment.com this is merciless ray mercer olympic gold medalist and board member of find the dream and you're locked in to beyond ringside Sunday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern here on BeyondRingside.com. Join us for the Midnight Black Mass. Myself, the Reverend Dan Wilson, brings you the dark gospel of professional wrestling. Uncensored, unedited, uncut, and not for the faint of heart. You can find out more about us at YouTube.com slash PottyHumor or subscribe at PottyHumor on iTunes and Stitcher today. Howdy friends, this is the Magic City Motormouth Fast Eddie Lane with your invitation to join yours truly along with Mark Mabo Bowman and the Oracle of Ominous, the Wicked Nemesis every Sunday night, 6.30 p.m. Eastern, 3.30 p.m. Pacific for Beyond Ringside Live. Wrestling, mixed martial arts, sports talk, and a whole lot more. Keep your eyes open on beyondringside.com for all of upcoming show information and of course catch us on social media as well. Until then, we'll see you this Sunday, 6.30 Eastern for Beyond Ringside ringside live on the beyond ringside radio network this is the crowd restless fan the 30 name wills <laughs> it's true you believe me you're locked in to beyond ringside <laughs> 